Welcome to the Nord Pentecostal Church live stream, a place to be family. Good morning and welcome to NPC. Um, my name is Edna and I just bring you greetings from my household. John and Gideon weren't able to be here today. And, uh, but I just wanted to say that we love you and we miss you very much. I wanted to read to you a scripture that came to my mind as I was reading this morning. It's from Philippians chapter four and it's verses four to seven. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pause for prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you that we could be here today. We thank you that we could gather online and yet together in spirit. I just pray for those of our congregation who are battling illness, Lord, that you would just be with them, or that they would feel your presence, Lord, because we know you're with them. And Lord, I pray for our team here at NPC as they plan for our upcoming services, Lord, and all the changes that keep happening, Lord. Be with our families as uh, families look ahead to September and plan, Lord, that you would just uh, be with us as we ponder what that means for schools and uh, for each of our families, Lord. We praise you and we thank you that we can gather in spirit in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, you're welcome to stand with us and worship today. And we're going to just raise a hallelujah right off the bat. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. In the 
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Just the voices. And Lord, I need you. Oh. Beside you, all around you, and within you, he is 
with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, 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 he is for you. open just with a word of prayer for the sermon this morning and let you know that we will be celebrating communion at the end of the sermon today before we go back into worship. So if you have your elements ready, that's good. Uh, if not, take a moment in the next uh, 20 minutes or so and get those ready so that you can celebrate with us as we move into communion. Let's take a moment and pray. Father, I thank you that you are present always. Lord, in the midst of everything that we face in life, um, we are looking for something to turn to, 
I pray that that something is a person and that it becomes you for those who, who have no one, nothing. That we would turn to you in all these moments, Lord, that are hard, especially this year, and that we would find our faith and our trust building around the only person who can really make a difference in our lives and give us peace in all of these storms. And so, Lord, I, I just ask that you would send an extra measure of your presence into the lives of those listening today, that they would be able to face the day knowing that you are fighting with them, going before them to prepare everything that you have in store. And so, Lord, we bring you praise today and ask that you would be in the reading of your word and in this sermon, that you would use it to speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing with our series about beach days, the times where Jesus is teaching near water, and today we're going to look at one of those moments. But I uh, was thinking about an illustration for this, for this sermon, and all I could think about was public pools. Now, I said last week I'm not really a person who likes going swimming. I don't care for it, but there were times where I would go swimming with my family, um, where we'd go to a friend's house and we'd go in a pool. And some of you own pools, and maybe eventually we'll come over and visit, and my kids and they'll enjoy the water and I'll sit on your deck or over on the side and just enjoy the day. Uh, but I remember times swimming in pools with people and there, we, we had a little community pool growing up and uh, it wasn't very deep and it wasn't very big and I think the limit when I was a teenager, I remember reading that the limit was about 25, 30 people, something like that. But I remember days as an eight, nine-year-old going down with my family and, and sitting in the little waiting area and realizing there's probably about 80 people in this pool and it's crowded and you have no room to move and everyone's bumping into each other and there's kids trying to dive in and it's just ridiculous. Like how do you actually find a space to enjoy yourself? And then I remember uh, living uh, or visiting in a... Uh, uh, apartment complex that had a pool built into it and we were able to go and enjoy that and and uh, it wasn't the cleanest pool but it was never full there was only usually two or three people in there the water was clean but around it was always cluttered and they weren't picking up the leaves and but at least it was treated and we knew that the water was safe so we would try to enjoy those days as well but again the, the theory of a public pool not a private home pool but a public pool is like how do you really enjoy those moments unless it's just relief from the heat? What are you really enjoying about the moment of people crowding around you? Then I got thinking about uh, something else. What about public fountains? Like, you, you know, you walk through the store or downtown somewhere and they have this nice little fountain that goes off and people throw coins in all the time and, and you always see that there's people enjoying it and they're just watching it or they're sitting nearby and they're just kind of enjoying the day. And there are videos online of people who will run and jump into the fountains, not just the outdoor ones, the ones inside of malls and shopping centers. And, and they will just go and have a blast inside this little fountain. And, and, and some of them are actually tiny little things, no bigger than a table, but they'll find a way to get into it and sit under the water. And others are quite large, but people will go into them. And I started wondering, what is it that drives people to get into public fountains, into these little um, areas where it's just meant to be a, a sight catcher. You're just meant to look at it and enjoy the sound of it and what it's doing, the, the vision of it. But people go in. And, and so there's a few things. Maybe they just bought a new swimsuit and they want to try it out. Like that's kind of ridiculous, but I guess it is a possibility. Um, maybe they're jumping in and showing off their talent of swimming in hopes that some professional coach will sign them to their team. Uh, chances are none of that is true, and it's probably just the fact that they want the attention in the moment. They're doing it probably for social media or something to show, hey, look at me, I've got a snorkel and shorts and flip-flops on in the mall, and I'm going to go jump in the fountain. But that's that's what we see sometimes. And YouTube has a lot of these videos, and they are quite funny to watch, but they're also extremely ridiculous. This morning, we're going to look at a passage in John 5 where a man spent his days, many days, beside a fountain or a pool, depending on the translation you read, starving for the attention of just one person who would come along and help him. All of this sets up for the most powerful encounter that he will ever have. So we're going to be reading from John chapter 5 in the NIV, verses 1 through 9. So sometime later, 
Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people, disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, pick up, or get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. Now, I think it's important this morning that we pay attention to a few items in this passage, both because they show the nature, the person of Jesus and his kindness, but also because we need to learn to read between the lines of scripture. Now, I want to explain what that means. It's to add the context of what it actually is, not add new context, not add content, not twist the passage, but see the heart of the gospel at work in the midst of the scripture that we're, we are reading. We'll come to know that what we see in the actions of the words of Jesus in the Bible is who he is in our lives when we read between the lines. That means that the more we read the book, the Bible, the more we read it, the more we find out who he is and what he is up to in various seasons of our lives. Now here's why I bring it up. As a pastor, I have had a few people tell me that they feel God has been absent in their life over time. Maybe it's been one event that's brought about this sense of, of God not being there. Or maybe it's been just a lifetime of moments where you feel like you've been abandoned and God is not near you. When we read scripture and we look at the events that unfold, chances are uh, very high that we will see something in our lives that echoes what we are reading in scripture and we are actually walking through that in the same way. So don't just read and see the words and think, well, that's it for today. You have to occasionally uh, go into it and meditate on the word. What, what is it trying to say? Where do you see the gospel at work in, in what you are reading that day? How do you see it highlighted, the nature of Jesus, his personality, the traits of who he is? How do you see that coming forth in what it is that you're reading? Don't just take it at face value, but sit and meditate on what you read and draw out the truth that God is showing you in your life right now. Now, we have to be careful. Uh, don't look for your truth. I hear that used and see it used a lot in social media and other areas that we're just living our truth or we're just looking for our truth. We're not looking in the Bible for our truth. That's when we start to twist scripture and make it match what we want. We're looking for God's truth. We're looking for the truth. So when you meditate, pray that the Holy Spirit will open your mind to what the truth is in that moment. Draw out what God is showing you. Let's move on. Uh, so here's a few things that I think we need to pay attention to. First, Jesus approaches one man where a great number of disabled people would be. It was typical of these pools to be surrounded by many who were ill. The waters were thought to be medicinal in nature, and at times healing would actually come to those who could wade within them. Now, if you've ever been to like a hot spring or one of those natural springs that comes up, you know that there's theories that the water that comes through it, whether it be full of some kind of mineral or whatever it is, that it actually provides a sense of healing. I, I know people who have gone to hot springs personally, like natural hot springs, and they say that areas like arthritis and other joint issues have been relieved for a time because they sat in that spring full of water and warmth. Now, I don't know the science behind it, but for some reason it is true. It does work, and there is a form of healing for various conditions. At times there have been stories of people who found total healing in the waters of natural springs, so the belief at this time that the pools, when stirred, would provide some form of healing isn't far off from what the truth could be. However, there were also many superstitious beliefs about the pools, like angels coming down to stir the waters. Now, some manuscripts have included this in verse 4, where it reads, From time to time an angel of the Lord would come and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool would be cured of whatever illness they had. However, 
we need to understand that it was discovered, this was probably added much later in time. It was added by, not by John or a scribe following John's words, but by somebody else who was trying to give explanation of why the waters were being stirred, whether it be an angel or possibly natural springs underneath that came and stirred the water and, and, and made it move. That verse wasn't in original manuscripts. It was probably added after 400 AD. Regardless, this man is picked out by Jesus among the many who were there. Just this one man. Now you may ask why Jesus picked that man and not another, or why just one? Well, we'll get to the second question, why just one, in, in a few moments. But possibly the reason of why he chose this man is actually rest in the timeline of his illness. 38 years. Now, no reason is given to why he has suffered for 38 years. We only know it has been at least four decades, or in the last four decades of his life, he has suffered through this form of disability, probably being paralyzed. Most likely, much of that time was spent sitting beside the pool, hoping that someone would stop and help him into the water when it was stirred up, hoping in that moment that he would find healing. A little deeper onto this point, it says that Jesus learned of his illness and how long he had been ill. We need to understand, it, it would come to no surprise that this isn't saying that Jesus asked questions. He didn't sit down and say, how long have you been sick and how long have, or, or what is it that you have going on with you? That isn't how this broke down. See, when we look at the word learned, it's translated from the Greek word, which means to perceive or come to know. But when it's used to speak of Jesus, we're looking at not an understanding of him sitting down and coming to know a person, but the fact that he has supernatural knowledge through the experience that he has as the son of God who created people and has seen them from the beginning of time to the end of time in the place that they will be when he encounters them. So he is, it, when it says he learned of the illness and how long he had suffered from it, it actually means that he already knew through supernatural knowledge, what the man was facing. And knowing each person at the pool that day, all that they faced and how long they had faced it, Jesus is drawn to this man and in an act of sheer compassion, now notice that's the third week in a row that that word has come up, compassion. In compassion for this man, Jesus speaks with him and begins an encounter which will change his life. The next item of importance is that Jesus again simply speaks in authority. Pick up your mat and walk. So he spoke to the storm and it stopped in all of its rage. In the midst of this blinding storm where the waves were crashing in and swamping the boat, he spoke, peace, be still or quiet, stop it. And it stopped. He spoke to the demons as we talked about last week and they left a man who had been tormented day and night and who later went on and told uh, many people of how good God is. Now, he speaks to this man who's been paralyzed for 38 years to pick up his mat and walk. It's another direct show of authority over an area of life that only God has authority. So Jesus has three different instances and three different timelines where he speaks to time and space and shows his authority over all things to let people know he is God. See, the interesting thing is in Jesus speaking is that doctors would have applied ointments and oils and given pills they would have fitted braces and crutches on him. Some faith healers would have told him to do certain things and pay certain amounts of money to ensure that whatever God they served would come and hear his prayers. Friends would tell him to just give up and maybe embrace the illness that he has. Maybe they would come and console him when he was really down. But Jesus steps on the scene and he speaks life and healing into him. Now maybe you've been in a spot like this where you've tried dozens of things and you just hope the next thing is the one that will work. Maybe because of that you have lost trust on those who say they can help or you've decided just to live with whatever it is that you are facing. Now I know a man, uh, not, not like just that I know of a man, I actually know this man personally who prayed for 30 years about a skin condition, one that wasn't really impacting life in general, but one that would bother him immensely. It, it, it would flake off everywhere that he'd go. He'd have skin off of all parts of his body that would just flake and fall around everywhere. And 
he prayed for 30 years and he tried lotions and he went to doctors and he tried oils and he tried ointments and pills and everything. And at one point he stopped everything for a season. He stopped even praying about it, just believing that it was time to just say, you know what, I'm going to face this the rest of my life. I might as well just be dealing with it. But he was encouraged by this verse to continue to pray. And one day after 30 years of praying and trying all of these different avenues, he woke up and the skin condition was completely gone. He prayed for over 30 years and he woke up one day after praying and he's never faced it again. See, there's just something about the authority of Jesus that makes the difference where nothing else can. For this man, he possibly had no idea who the man was. In fact, in verse 11, it tells us that when the Pharisees came to ask, who healed you? Who told you to get up and walk? Why are you carrying your mat on the Sabbath? He said, I don't know who it was. He just told me to pick up my mat and go. But his heart of compassion led Jesus to speak to the man's infirmity and it caused new strength to come upon him, allowing him to then stand and walk. Lastly, the man was not chosen because of his faith. Now this might be a shock to some of us, but it, he, he didn't have this great amount of faith in who Jesus was and what he could do. Notice the encounter begins with Jesus asking, do you want to get well? It's not the encounter we are used to with Jesus and healings. We're used to hearing things like, Lord, if you would just say the word, if you could just, if I could just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, Lord, I want to be well. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But not this time. Jesus begins the encounter with a man who is at the water because of superstitions. Actually, um, not just superstitions, but there, there is thought that he was there specifically because that pool was linked to the Greek god of healing. So it could be that Jesus is encountering a man who would come to a pool to find healing from a god who doesn't move and doesn't exist, and Jesus showed mercy on him and became his hero that day. See, he showed up for a different reason and Jesus came and encountered him. This question, do you want to get well, shows that the man had no hope outside of who Jesus is. But instead of answering the question, he doesn't look at Jesus and say, well, Lord, I would love to. He goes on and complains about his state of life. Nobody picks me up and puts me in the pool when it's stirred. When the water is troubled, I can't get in. I am unable to move and nobody helps me. He complains. See, what we may miss is the question was also intended to prepare the man's heart for faith. Now, indeed, faith did begin to rise within him, though he only complained at the question and told of his problems. There was some measure of faith in his heart in that moment when this man was asked by Jesus, do you want to get well? Something awoke in his heart and his spirit, and he believed Maybe this is my moment. So much so that when Jesus spoke those words, get up, take your mat and walk, he instantly got up, rolled up his mat and began to walk. Now it's not because of the faith that he had before the encounter, but because of the goodness and compassion of Jesus to speak to this illness and see it removed, even in spite of his lack of faith. So now we come to us. What does all this reading between the lines show, uh, show us of God's nature and character towards us today? So let's take a few moments this morning and look at these things. First off, uh, Jesus does heal. Now, there's something I want to deal with that is a little bit controversial, but it's something that needs to be dealt with, and that is um, the knowledge that there is a gospel out there preached by some called the prosperity gospel. And, and the, the heart of it is to think that uh, Jesus heals everyone always, and that if you're not being healed, then maybe you just don't have enough faith, or maybe you're not giving enough money, or there's something askew in your life that is bringing you to a point where you're just not being healed by Jesus. Now, it, it obviously has to deal with wealth stuff as well, but we're dealing with a health issue about it today. Um, we need to understand that Jesus does heal, but in this moment right here, it comes to the understanding that it's not always everyone always. There, there's only one moment in scripture where it says that Jesus went into the town and healed all of their sicknesses. Other times it says he healed the sick and he healed some of their illnesses. And this moment he picks one man at the side of a pool where dozens would have been lying around waiting 
for somebody to come and possibly give them money or help in that kind of an instance. He just helps the one. He picked one among many. And what it speaks to is the knowledge that Jesus does heal. His miracles flow and he is a good and compassionate God who wants to be with us and around us and bring us healing. But it's not everyone always, all the time. We come to understand in this life that there are people who will become sick and do not find healing, even in absolute showing faith. They don't find it. So we need to have an understanding that if we are praying and we're not finding our healing, it doesn't speak to the possibility of a, an amount of sin or a lack of faith or we're not giving money to something that we should be. It's the knowledge that God is sovereign and he makes that decision. But it doesn't take away our responsibility to pray for ourselves and for others for healing in the hope and the belief that God is good and he will move among his people. But in this, again, he picked one among many. Now, I don't know why God chooses to heal some and not others. I'd personally like to know for myself why that decision is made the way it is. If you've ever prayed for a sick loved one and you see them pass, I don't have an answer on this earth as to why healing didn't happen. All I know is God has a plan for those moments. It may not be comforting in the moment or even years later to know that God's plan is there, but one day we will see perfectly to know fully what that plan was in those moments and how it played out in our lives. Now, I do comment that I still do believe that God heals. I've seen it in my life. Uh, I've told some of you about the miracles that I've seen in my life, the healings that I've uh, walked in. I've seen others that I've prayed for many times over who have come to some form of healing, whether it be kidneys that were shutting down and they began to work, whether it arms that couldn't bend, backs that were sore that were relieved. I've seen, I've seen many different forms of healing take place through praying for people. And it's incredible to watch the joy come upon that person when they realize that God is doing something. I remember testimony of a lady who said that after I prayed for her, she was down to just a half of one kidney that was working, and the doctor said that it was not working anymore, and she was going to have to go on dialysis and, and deal with a whole life of how that was going to look, and we prayed for her, and she came back the next week and said, the doctors told me my kidney is working as if it was full, and that is an incredible testimony to know that that has happened through faith, that God is doing things. I believe that he still heals. I believe in his miracles so much so that when a good friend of mine passed, I prayed in that moment that God would resurrect him, that his life would come back to him. Now I'll tell you that it didn't happen. Whatever reason it didn't, it, it didn't. If God gave him the choice, I know that having seen heaven, he'd probably choose heaven over this earth. But I still believe he can do these great things. We need to be in prayer. The point is, don't stop praying. This man waited 38 years and wasn't praying. But tomorrow could be your day. Today could be your day. Don't give up on prayer. Which leads to the next point. Jesus is never removed from your troubles. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. See, he hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't left you alone to face the troubles that you have on your own. He hasn't abandon you. Whether it be three minutes or 38 years, he is just as close to you in what you face. He hasn't turned away. And he hasn't decided that it's just not worth it. He is always with you. We may at times feel like we are alone in what we face, but be assured that Jesus is standing with you in every moment. Maybe he has asked us, do you want to get well? Maybe he's giving you the strength to face the storm and make it to the other side. Maybe he is giving you an extra measure of grace to endure the momentary horror because the significant weight of glory that comes from what we face will be measured out for you in spades in eternity. See, what we need to come to an understanding of is that on this side of eternity, we won't know why some are healed and some aren't, why maybe a friend of ours was and we're not being healed, why some troubles are eased and yet some are intensified, what I know is the way I face what this life throws at me is a standard of faith for others to look at and understand the goodness of God is not measured by the trouble I face, 
but by the grace I face those troubles with. You see, faith isn't always set in the eradication of life's troubles and its storms, but it is solidified in the middle of the worst ones, and people will see how we face those times in perseverance and peace. And they will know that life still happens, but our God will see us through even if it is directly into his arms when the storm is at its worst. God will see us through. Jesus has not abandoned you in your trouble. His authority reigns over each one of them. Every storm that we have, his authority reigns over it. But sometimes he speaks to the trouble and sometimes he speaks to our hearts. Our responsibility is to listen, to know the difference for when these take place. Is he speaking to my heart to help me to persevere through the storm that I'm facing? Or is he speaking directly to the storm, to that trouble, to make it go away? Be aware of when those moments take place. Finally on this, miracles will happen in spite of the person's faith. Notice it says, I mentioned that Jesus encountered the man. He asked him, do you want to get well? It doesn't always depend on the person's faith because God will do things as he decides to do things. Miracles will happen in spite of a person's faith. Here's what it means. If you are praying for a miracle in someone's life who is not a believer, don't stop praying and standing on your faith in those moments. Your anchor of hope may be all that they are holding on to. And I have seen people's lives changed as God steps in long before they actually believe in him. Honestly, a miracle in a person's life may not even bring them faith, but it will do much for the kingdom. God never wastes a miracle. There have been debates about this for decades, and I honestly don't understand why there have been debates and multiple platforms and moments where people go back and forth because there are multiple times in Scripture where Jesus comes alongside a person, where God will heal from a distance uh, what is happening. If you just speak a word, my servant will be healed. My daughter, my son, whatever it is, would, would be healed. There's no account for the faith that they have that they're not following Jesus. Samaritans, Gentiles, whatever it is, they're not followers of Jesus. They just come with a knowledge that he is capable because somebody told them that he is capable. And so we have to come to the understanding that when we pray for somebody's miracle that doesn't follow Jesus, we can't stop praying because our faith could actually see that miracle through. Maybe the people in scripture where this has happened have heard of God's goodness. They know of the nature of Jesus and the works that he has done, and that does not disqualify them from the miracle that they seek. We cannot discount the works of God in the lives of those who lack faith in him. He will do as he does for his own glory, even when it is totally confounding to us. It's done in order that more people will see his good works and give him praise. Now, we need to come to this conclusion on this that God will heal as he wants to heal. Now, it's again, it's not totally comforting to all of us who are suffering through something to know that it might not be on this side of eternity that he brings us healing and wholeness, that it might be on the other side, but it doesn't remove the fact that when we pray, when we face these things with grace, people will notice that and will begin to bring praise to Jesus. See, that is what this is all about. And this miracle for the man at the pool was not wasted because he went away and told the Pharisees it was Jesus who brought me healing. And then they accused him of many things like doing works on the Sabbath, that it was illegal. And they held, you know, understand if you don't know about the Pharisees, they're the religious elite, the teachers of the law who hold people to this incredible standard that they don't hold themselves to. That if anyone breaks a law, they will punish them incredibly so. And so when they found out that Jesus healed on the Sabbath, they went after him. And they wanted to not just bring accusation, but they wanted to bring, um, really, eventually, they brought death to him because of who he said he was and the things that he was doing. That is who the Pharisees are. They were a people who dominated the area based on what they wanted people, how they wanted people to act, what they wanted to see from their lives, and didn't live up to those standards on their own. This miracle is about the compassion of Jesus. It brought faith to this man's life. But what was the greater impact of the miracle? What what was the extension of this moment 
between Jesus and this man? Was it just that he had faith for that moment so that he could pick up his mat and walk? The truth is, is that more people heard of Jesus and how he was not confined by the law that the Pharisees inflicted on everyone. They imposed incredible standards on people, as I said. Now, he didn't break the law. He just wasn't confined to it. He simply understood the point of what the law is and brought it to completion so everyone who chose to worship God could do so freely. Not, no longer tied to the incredible expectations of those who deem themselves the judge of people based on what they want it to happen. So Jesus worked in compassion through the heart of the Father so we would see him for who he is. Not just a good person, not just, not just somebody who's mentioned in different holy books and all throughout the Bible, but that he is the Son of God and that he has authority over all things, including doing miracles for people who do not follow him. Because quite simply, he is just that good. The scene of Jesus and the crippled man plays out in our lives often, but we may miss it because of our assumptions of God's actions only being for those who have faith. But listen, I want you to think back to who you were before Jesus. Think back in those timelines of what it was like living without him. Do you notice the actions of God? Do you see the things that he had done in your life before you came to faith? Maybe those of you who, who aren't in faith can take a, knowledge or a step right now and, and reflect on, well, possibly this was God. You know, it's the season where normally we'd be running VBS and uh, they talk about God sightings, noticing the times where God is active and things that he's doing. Do you have any of those in your life? Do you have those moments where he is active and you can't explain what it is around you? You just know something happened and it's incredible? Chances are that's God trying to get your attention trying to draw you in, to pursue you, to bring you closer to who he is so you get to know his heart and that he is doing these things out of the goodness of who he is, pursuing you with his miracles to show his nature of kindness and compassion. See, he does these things, even though we may think they don't make sense, he does it so that many will come to see him and to know him. The truth of the matter is, when we look at scripture, and I love this, this verse where it says that yet while we were still sinners, he gave his life for us. That means that the miracle that we experienced of salvation for those who believe, that moment where we came to him, that was a miracle that happened before we had faith in him. And so who are we to say that God can't do incredible things for those who don't have faith in him when it's actually happened in our lives? So here's your homework, and this is my conclusion. And then we're going to go into a time of communion. If you haven't started praying for the miracles in the lives of those who are far from God, start. Start to pray for miracles in your life as well, that they may see his works and bring him praise. Yes, we need to pursue the person of God above the works, pursue his presence, daily go after it, soak it up. But remember the works come with the person and they are tied together. If we know anything about God, it's that he's unchanging and that who he is, it's always who he's going to be. And you cannot separate the areas of his nature into individual pieces. He is one God and, and his works come with his person. So when we know that we have Jesus in our life, that means that we also have the authority of his voice and his hand active in our lives at all times. His miracles are a part of who he is. So let's start believing for better and bigger things in 2020. Let's start to dream with him again. I know this has been a really difficult year, and for many of us, we look at it and go, yeah, this isn't what I want. I don't want a life like this. It is really hard. So let's, let's start believing that we will see, even in the midst of a pandemic, that we will see God do incredible things, that revival will come, that here miracles of healing will begin to take place, that many, many people who are far from God would come to see who he is and the goodness and the kindness and the compassion that he has in his heart for all people. He will not waste a miracle. So let's begin to pray for them today. Now, if you have your elements ready, we're going to go into a moment of communion to share and to pray for miracles in our lives and for those around us as well as we share in the cup. 
and the bread. I'm going to begin by reading, as I always do, from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we have in our hands bread and juice, whatever form that is. For me, I have water today. Now, the understanding of Scripture is that, of the Scripture we read today, is that Jesus is good to all people, and he will do as he pleases to do according to his will, his Father's will, that he does what his Father has called him to do. And so miracles will happen just because that's who God is. But we have the responsibility to pray for those. And so as we share in the cup uh, and the bread today, my desire is that we would pray for miracles in our lives and those around us, and that many will come to salvation. And see, in Scripture it says that by his stripes we are healed. And the bread representing the body, the stripes that came across the body, the broken, bruised, and beaten body of Jesus would perform for us the miracle of giving us healing. And so if there is a need in your life or you know somebody close by who has a need, as you share in the bread today, would you give thanks that the body of Jesus was bruised for you so that you can pray for healing that it may come? And let's believe in faith that that healing would flow because I would love to start to heal, hear testimonies of how God moved in the midst of this time and brought many miracles to the lives of those who believe. So let's share in the bread today and give thanks. As we share the cup, let's give thanks that it is by the blood that the miracle of salvation was able to take place, is able to take place. And so let's give thanks for all the miracles that are going to take place, but also for the fact that from that we will see many people come to a knowledge of Jesus and who he is, and that he is a Lord of their life, that he's friend, that he is closer than a brother, and that he is Lord. Let's give thanks today. Join me as we pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this story. That this man waited 38 years by a pool, possibly the whole time, days, nights, however long it was, for a chance to go into waters that were stirred. And you came along, Jesus, and you said, do you want to get well? And then you said, pick up your mat and walk. Lord, there are many right now who are ill from various things, various sicknesses. And Jesus, we know that your heart is to bring healing and that your goodness delivers that. And so I pray, Father, that you would move in such a wonderful manner that we would start to hear the testimony of those who rise up and say, my God healed me on this day from this. That it would bring such encouragement to us that we would start to believe for even better things. And so, Lord, we thank you for the body of Jesus that was beaten for us, that was given stripes by whips and by reeds so that we could, um, so that we could come and pray for healing. And Father, we pray for each one right now who is sick that you would bring healing across their body. And for all those who are far from you as we believe in miracles, Lord, that you would bring a miracle in their life, that it would speak to them and many others as we start to see your works, that many would come to you. We're not seeking just the works, just the hand. We're seeking the maker as well. But Lord, would you begin to do great things? And Father, we thank you for salvation, that it brought us into your family, that it brought us to a place where we are sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters with Christ, where we are co-heirs, and that for all eternity we will rest with you in glory. And so, Father, we give you thanks for what you're about to accomplish in this time. And I pray for each one who is saying right now, I, I want Jesus in my life. 
that you would come instantly, Lord. Holy Spirit, that you would come and dwell upon them and lead them into the path that brings them to a knowledge of who Jesus is, deeper and deeper in grace and in truth. And so, Lord, we bring you ourselves today. We pray that you would bless each one who's listening, but God, also that we would be a blessing, that we would share our faith with others as we have ability and opportunity to do so, that you would open those doors and give us boldness and courage in the midst of it. And God, give us great testimony. We already have a good testimony of who you are and what you've done. Father, continue to extend that. Continue to bring the miracles that we hear of in Scripture and we hear of around the world, that we would see them in our lives today. And Lord, in the, in the storm that we all face with COVID-19, we bring your name against it. Whatever form that you would use, whether it be vaccine or treatments or miraculously removing it, God, we're not shutting the door on anything, that you would do what you need to do to bring yourself glory and we would see an end to this season of life. Lord, we bring you all praise today and give you thanks for what you have done and will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us online today. If you uh, haven't had a chance to join our in-person services, they, uh, they still have, you still have those opportunities on Sundays at 9.30 and 11.30. If you just jump online and book one of those slots and let us know who's coming, how many, we'd love to see your face again. Have a wonderful week. And how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Let's sing that again. And how great. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice.